Uh, Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> try to get into some of these verses tonight, but I want to begin <clears throat> by talking about it's been a debate for centuries in what we call so-called uh, theologian circles. And the debate has always been between, and it it's, it's goes back as far back in church history as you can find, you basically got two types of, of, of Bible believers and how they approach Bible study, and that is covenant theology. Uh, that are those who just believe there's nothing in the Bible but the covenants, and that every man saved is brought into the covenant programs uh, of the Old Testament. And then you have what we call dispensational theology. And, and when people ask me, uh, which one are you, covenant or dispensational theologian, I say I'm both. And because both are true. And both are in the Bible. The only man who uses the word dispensation in the Bible is the Apostle Paul. Right? He uses it four times. 1 Corinthians 9, 7, a dispensation of the gospel which was committed unto me. Ephesians chapter 3 talks about the dispensation of the grace of God given to him for us Gentiles, right? He talks about that he was made a minister according to the dispensation of God given to me to fulfill the word of God. Paul is the only man in the Bible that uses the word dispensation. And if you read Romans chapter 1 verse 1, you understand why that is. Paul was separated under the gospel of God. Paul was a distinct and separated apostle by Jesus Christ for a special ministry that God had kept secret since the world began. And what we have to understand is that redemption. When you look right here at the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood was shed right there. And that blood being shed brought a New Testament in force. Right? There is a New Testament now in our Bible due to the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he shed his blood for. And this New Testament has brought many benefits to the beneficiaries of the New Testament. The New Testament is now in force in the blood of Christ. And there are many beneficiaries of this New Testament of, of the Lord Jesus Christ with all of its benefits. Some of the benefits of the redemption is adoption. Right? Inheritance. Uh, new bodies. A new body. Immortality. Uh, vocations. Callings. Right? And there's all these benefits of the New Testament and there's many beneficiaries of this New Testament. Righteousness. Justification. All these things. But what we have to understand as we come to the New Testament, that the New Testament has two ministries of its benefits. There are two ministries now of this New Testament out here. The New Testament ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ through his redemption, through his redemption work of the cross, there are, now, there are now two ministries of the New Testament. And I'll write them up here. There's the covenantal ministry of the New Testament, meaning that Israel's new covenant, the new covenant with Israel is a part of the New Testament. But there's also a dispensational ministry of the New Testament. Now both, both people, both groups, you talk about the Israel of God and you talk about, you talk about the Jew and Gentile, we'll call it the new man that's now being created in this present dispensation. Both are a part of the New Testament church, right? Both of them are, but both of them are not a part of the same ministry of the New Testament, right? Right? And so, and so, I hope you're following along with this, that there is a, there are, there is a, a covenant part of the New Testament that is according to everything God spoke in prophecy back here to the nation of Israel. 
When he says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, that's part of prophecy, right? And so the new covenant under the New Testament is in accordance to, to what God had spoken in prophecy. But, and, and under this new covenant, Israel is the beneficiaries. You are not participating in Israel's covenant program. You're just not. You are not the beneficiaries of the promises made to the nation of Israel. Now you are partaking in their spiritual things. But you are not participating and taking from Israel the promises made unto them, unto them under their covenants of promise. Now you are partaking in spiritual benefits. They're right here. Right? And so, and so Israel under the new covenant is the beneficiaries of the New Testament through the new covenant. The way Israel receives the benefits of the New Testament is under this new covenant. Well, what's, what's, the benefit, what's the benefits of the new covenant with Israel? Remember back here under their law program. Do you all think God has done with the law? Let me ask you that. The problem was never the law to begin with. The law was given to Israel not to justify them. That law was never given to Israel to justify them with God. How is Israel justified with God? Through faith. It's always been through faith. Well, then what was the purpose of the law? The law was for Israel's sanctification. That's what it was for. Right? When God says, if you will keep these, if you, he, says, he says, now if you will obey my voice, you shall be a peculiar people unto me, he said, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a what? Unholy nation. What was the law designed to do? It was designed for Israel's holiness. It was designed to make them a holy nation. Now, let me ask you this. Did they keep it? So what's the, what's the purpose of the new covenant? I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds and I will cause them. Right? Israel could not keep this law. So under the New Testament, God has provided through for them under the New Covenant the means by which they are going to become that holy nation to fulfill their purpose that God has given them. Israel has a purpose in this earth. And what, what's going to happen is, is when Israel receives the New Covenant as part of the New Testament in accordance to the to, to the prophetic promises, Israel's going to become that holy nation out here in the kingdom, and they're finally going to fulfill their purpose of being a holy nation, and through them, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. That's God's program for what? The earth. Now, when we look at the dispensational aspect of it, Paul was made an able minister of what? The New Testament. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul was made an able minister of the New Testament according to the dispensation of the mystery of Christ. And so we are beneficiaries of the New Testament, but not according to Israel's covenants. We are beneficiaries of the New Testament according to the mystery that God had kept secret since the world began. Now, you are participating in spiritual things that pertain to Israel. Adoption. Glory. I didn't put that one up there. Glory. Right? You, you are participating in eternal life, the, uh, an inheritance, uh, and all this stuff as being the seed of Abraham. You are the seed of Abraham. Paul said that in Galatians chapter 3. If ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so we are heirs, right? But, the, but, but what we are receiving is not the benefits of the New Testament to fulfill the covenant program that God prophesied. We are receiving the benefits of the New Testament according to the dispensation of the mystery of God committed to the Apostle Paul. We are, all benefits of the, we are all beneficiaries of the New Testament. Israel and the new man. 
right? But we are receiving the benefits of the New Testament according to the dispensation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. And so your New Testament now, your New Testament has two ministries in it, doesn't it? Right? Is there two ministries of the New Testament? Yes. What are they? Right there. Romans through Philemon. At the beginning of that one, Paul said he was separated under the gospel of God concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord and then the ministry of the New Testament here to Israel according to the covenant of prophecy. We are receiving the benefits of the New Testament here through the dispensation of that New Testament given to the Apostle Paul. And so, and so this means that when you, when you study these two ministries, there are things that are going to be similar. Right? There are things that are similar about the two ministries. Both of them involve sons. In both these programs, there are sons in that program. You're going to read about them in Hebrews chapter 2. He's bringing many sons unto glory. Who did the adoption pertain to? Israel. Romans 9, 4. In both programs, they're sons. In both programs, there are heirs. In both programs, there are glory. Right? Israel's going to enter into their glory here. Look in Isaiah. Let me show you this. Look over in Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah 60 and verse 1. <clears throat> he says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. That's Israel when they receive their glory out here in the kingdom. Now look at what he says. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, Gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. That's in Revelation 21. The kings of the, the, kings of the nations that are saved shall walk in the light of that city. But right here we see that the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of what? Thy what? Rising. Now, is that what's going on with the Gentiles today? The Gentiles have received dispensational riches through the fall of Israel, not their rising. That's the mystery, right? The mystery is not Gentile salvation. The mystery is this whole dispensation of the mystery in which Gentiles are fellow heirs. That's the mystery. The, 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 the rest of this up here, the Gentiles are going to be blessed through the rise and the glory and the covenant of Israel. There's differences there. But there are things that are similar. Right? And both, so both programs involve sons, heirs, glory, redemption, justification, eternal life, uh, uh, forgiveness of sins. But then, but then there are things, there are things, there are things that, that in the two ministries are distinct and separate. There are things that are distinct about these, these two ministries. Some of them are the vocation. We do not have the same vocation as Israel. Right? We don't have the same inheritance as Israel. The chronology of these two programs are different. I have, I have, I have, uh, 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 I have appointed days as far as this program goes that are different from this one, right? The hope, the hope Israel's going to be looking for here is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to institute the kingdom. That's not what me and you are looking for today, right? And so what we're looking for today is the rapture of the body of Christ up to the, up to the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's where our vocation is. And so though they are similar, there are, very, there are things that are very distinct and different about these two ministries and 
the doctrines and the instructions in these two programs are different. Right? God is going to teach Israel some different things about their program that he's not going to teach you. Now, there are things that are going to be true in both programs. But there's things he's teaching them here as he brings them into the bond of the new covenant that he's not teaching you here. One of them is this. Of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. That's different. Now, if you don't think that Israel's being taught about the times and seasons of the day of the Lord in their program, you're not reading. Peter clearly tells them in 2 Peter chapter 3 to be mindful of the words that were spoken by the prophets and by the holy apostles. Because in the last days, scoffers are going to come. Say, where is the promise of his coming? Right? They're being taught about the program of the day of the Lord, whereas Paul says, you have no need that I write unto you. But guess what he teaches us about? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Behold, I show you a mystery, not all shall sleep. You find me one place where Israel is taught about that event in Hebrews through Revelation. It's not there. And so there's different chronologies for the two programs and there's different doctrines and instructions for the two programs. But both are a part of the New Testament church. And both are beneficiaries of the spiritual benefits of the New Testament. But they have different ministries. But they also, now get this, because this is what Paul teaches us in Ephesians. They both have a day out here in the future called the fullness of times in which both become one. All things in earth, all things in heaven. So there is a, 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 a meeting point in the future. And so I point all this out. Look in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. The, 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 the main thing to get here is that the New Testament had two programs in it. Now, one of them had never been revealed. That's why it's dispensational. Because it was only made known through the dispensation committed to the Apostle Paul. The other one was covenantal, meaning it had already been covenanted in the prophetic scriptures with Israel. So one of them's dispensational, one of them's covenantal, right? And but but both both are a part of the same New Testament. Now now look in Ephesians chapter three, verse seven. Paul said, "Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles." the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So Paul, Paul is a minister of what? What is he a minister of? He's a minister of a dispensation. You read that back in verse 2. How that, he, he said, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given to me, you would. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And so Paul was a minister of this dispensation of the grace of God to us Gentiles to preach what without that dispensation was unsearchable. Now Christ said, now notice what he's preaching. He's not preaching that you're not Israel like, like our camp likes to say all the time. He's preaching unsearchable riches. His duty was to make known to us Gentiles these, these unsearchable riches of Christ, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's preaching the mystery of Christ. Now remember when Christ told the Jews, salvation is who? It's of the Jews. Remember when Christ told the Jews, he said, search the scriptures. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of who? 
me. That means that there were searchable things about Christ and unsearchable things about Christ. Right? One, one of them is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures of the prophets. This one here is the preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And those are two ministries in the Bible. All right? That's Ephesians. Now come to Hebrews chapter 8 and let's see what Hebrews is going to be talking to us about. Look at Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 6. Then we'll try to get into Hebrews for a few little bit here. Guys, I've been studying this stuff for 20-some years, man, and I, I'm just understanding it more and more and what it's about, right? These are, these are the benefits of the redemption of Christ. That's what you're reading about in Romans to Revelation. They're the benefits of the New Testament in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all believers are beneficiaries of that New Testament. But they're, they're, they're beneficiaries. The Gentiles are going to be beneficiaries of the New Testament out in the kingdom. They're going to inherit a kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. Purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those benefits of the Gentiles in the kingdom await the new covenant with Israel under the New Testament. But what God is doing at this present time is this dispensational ministry of, 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 of taking Jew and Gentile and making a new man to become the beneficiaries of the New Testament. Now look in Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better what? Covenant, which was established upon what? Better promises. Where were those promises made? Back here. Israel's new covenant was not a mystery. It was in prophecy. Now if you want to see what those better promises are, read, out, read Jeremiah 31. 31 through 34. It's quoted here in Hebrews 8. Look, look at verse 8. Finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, and saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So who's the new covenant for? House of Israel and the house of Judah. And so when you got a Gentile out there claiming to be a covenant theologian today and mocking dispensational Bible teachers, that man don't know what he's talking about. You Gentiles are still strangers to those things. That new covenant pertains to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Unless God's a liar. Right? Now, look at what he, look at what he says in verse 9. Here's the promises. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. What was the co covenant he made with their fathers? If you will obey, I will bless you. If you won't, I will curse you. Right? But what's, what's this covenant and the better promises? Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will. See the promise? Just like he spoke to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will multiply thee. Now he says here, he says, I will put my laws into their mind, write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Those are the terms of the new covenant. It is God becoming Jehovah to the nation of Israel. That's what it is. They couldn't perform it. They couldn't do it. And so God is going to step in and do it for them. Which he's already shed the blood that was needed to bring about that new covenant. 
And so what you have to understand, the reason I read this, Ephesians 3, Hebrews 8, Paul is dealing with dispensational grace as part of a mystery that God had kept hid. Hebrews is dealing with new covenant promises that were already revealed in, in, in the prophetic program. We got to get these distinctions, right? Because they're, they're part of two ministries. Now, like I said, there's going to be things similar, but you got, you got to get the differences. Now, the last time, the last time that we, we had church on Wednesday night, we began to look at a very simple outline in the book of Hebrews, all right? Look at Hebrews now. Let me erase this stuff. And so we have, to, we have to come to Hebrews understanding that you are now dealing with the, with the covenant program with Israel and the fulfillment of that covenant program that was already under the law and the prophets that had already been promised and already been spoken by God. Israel finds themselves in a weird place right now. They're living between the New Testament and their new covenant, right? And so, but, but Israel can become beneficiaries of the New Testament by simply believing the gospel, right? The, the, one of the common things that the two programs have in common is the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the redemption of the cross. And if Israel will simply believe that gospel, they will become beneficiaries of the New Testament, beneficiaries of adoption, glory, sonship, and all that stuff, but it's going to be according to the mystery that God is doing today and not the covenant program, right? Now look, look, look in Hebrews 1, 1 4. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews is going to make two points here about Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1 4, he talks about Christ being made so much better than the angels. And I want you to get this overview of the book of Hebrews. Better than the angels. All right, come to Hebrews 2.9 now. We pointed this out a few weeks back. Hebrews 2.9. We see Jesus who was. You see that was? Was made what? little lower than the angels, right? Now this, these two points here, these two points become the basis by which the writer of Hebrews is going to write the rest of the epistle. Look in chapter 3, verse 1, that word wherefore. In light of these two facts right here now, in light of these two facts being made better than the angels, Right, that mediator. Christ is the mediator between God and man for both programs. There's how many mediators are there between God and man? One, the man, Christ Jesus. And Christ is the mediator of God to mankind. And this mediator has been made better than the angels, but before he was exalted to that position, he come down and was first made a little lower than the angels. And in light of this, in chapter 3, verse 1, they're told to consider. Wherefore, look at what he says. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider what? Two things. The apostle. And he's going to talk about that, that apostle from 3-2 down to 4-13. Because that's not the, the main point the writer's wanting them to get. And we're going to talk about this. Israel, Israel, Israel has already been spoken to by this apostle. Right? In fact, by the time Hebrews comes back into play, it's been 2,000 years since the Son of God has spoken to the nation of Israel concerning their covenant and their kingdom, right? Israel hasn't heard a message about their kingdom or their Messiah now for over 2,000 years or close to 2,000 years. But he also wants them to consider, more importantly, 
the high priest of their profession. And that one runs from 414 all the way into 1018, and then he starts making some conclusions. Right? So what he wants them to consider is the authority of the mediator. Right? He wants them to understand that this mediator of this new covenant with them has been highly exalted above even the angels of God. But before that, he was made a little lower than the angels that he might be a faithful high priest to them in things pertaining to God. In other words, not only is he, now notice this, Moses and Aaron had, they were two different men with two different offices. But Christ, one man, as the mediator of that covenant and as the high priest who made the provision for their entrance into that new covenant. And so when he, when he after he gets done with all this, this, is going, this right here is going to be the main focus of the epistle. He's going to show them that Christ's priestly order is a better order. It's after the order of Melchizedek. God never looked at one priest out of the Levitical order and confirmed them with an oath. Not one of them. But you know what he said to the son? The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so he's a priest after a better order. He's a, he's a mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. He has become the minister of a better tabernacle. Right? He's, he's become, he's become the, the better sacrifice with better benefits. And they have a better way now. This is what Hebrews 10 is going to talk about. They have a better way of coming unto God. This is what this is the, the, the basic outline of the book of Hebrews, right? Going all the way up into chapter 10. And so all this concludes now when he gets to the end of all this, he begins to talk about faith. How are they going to live? By faith. Right? Why do you think he's emphasizing these better things? Unless, unless Hebrews is dealing with the nation of Israel when they reinstitute all the old things that they had in Moses. Right? What is the danger? The just shall live by what? If any man what? Draw back. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of, of them who draw back unto perdition, but unto them that believe to the saving of the soul. And as he, as he begins to lay out faith and all this stuff, he concludes the book with talking about Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of what? Our faith. What, is, what does he mean by that? Well, it's right there. Not only did Christ come as the author of that faith and, 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 and speak to them concerning these things, but he's also the one who made their provision for entrance into this. And so those Jewish people are going to have to have Jesus Christ as the sole object of their faith and nothing more. Right? Now look in chapter 5. Y'all give me a few minutes here. Because now, what have we established tonight? Well, we've established that the book of Hebrews is about the New Testament according to the covenantal promises and prophecy. That's what Hebrews is dealing with. We've established now what the overall outline of the book is. The, the apostle and the high priest of this new covenant. The messenger of it and the provider for it 
and how, how, how he has made provision for Israel to enter into this new covenant and he has become the author and finisher of their faith and they have to look to him and to him alone if they want to inherit the promises. This is what the book of Hebrews is laying out for us. Now, look in chapter 5. You're going to see the purpose of the epistle to the Jewish people. Look in, look in Hebrews 5, beginning in verse number, let's look at verse 12. Well, look at verse 11 first off. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. Now let me ask you this. Is Israel excusable? Do they have any excuse to still be dull of hearing? Absolutely not. Why is it that the Gentiles can tear through their scriptures and teach their own covenant program and their own promises better than they can? Can you explain that to me? You know, I, I, I'm very careful about what I say about that people, but I'll say this about them. They're God's family. They're God's house. God deals with them the way God sees fit to deal with them, and we need to see ourselves out of it for most of the time. But here's, here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. God spoke to this people in time past, nobody else. Right? Sundry times, diverse manners, all throughout their history. Right? From the time God called Abraham and then he, he, he spoke to Isaac, he spoke to Jacob, he came to him down there in, in Egypt in the book of Exodus, he ascended on Mount Sinai and, and, and gave him the covenant and the fiery law, sent prophet after prophet throughout their whole history. God has spoken to that people at different times and in different ways and then in the last days he spoke unto them by his son. That is, that is, we are talking about a nation of people that God has spoken to now for over thousands of years and throughout their entire history he spoke to them. Basically, Genesis through the Gospel of John. Now, now, here's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. We still... Remember when Christ told him in John 16, he says, he, says, he says, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead and guide you into all truth. There were still more things to say. But, but, but what the writer of Hebrews is saying is he's saying we have many things to still teach you and to show you, but you can't bear them because you're dull of hearing. Because you've never heard what God said to begin with. Look at the issue with them. Look in verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and to become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. What is he, what is he telling these people? That they're yet immature and unskilled in the word of God. That the word of God has never accomplished in them what it was designed to accomplish. And it wasn't, the, the word of God is designed to do much more than, get, than, than to get you to heaven. Israel ain't even going to heaven when they die. That was never their hope. Read Job. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and shall stand where? Upon the earth in the last days. And those skin worms eat my flesh, with my eyes shall I see God. What was Job's hope? Resurrection to the earth as the Redeemer lived upon it. Right? But Israel, this people never developed the skill that the Word of God was designed to give them. The skill of discerning good and evil. When Paul writes to Timothy and he tells him there about, about what, what does he tell him? He says, shun this. Withdraw thyself from this. 
And he's telling him all these. The book of Proverbs was designed to do the same thing. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Remember the psalmist? Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The word of God was designed to take that nation of people and develop a people who had, who had the skill of discerning good and evil. And here they are. Genesis through John had been given to this people. God had spoken to them through all this period of time. And here they were still dull of hearing, still immature, and still unskilled in the word of God. And so what is he doing? The book of Hebrews is not written to lay another foundation for Israel. God has already spoke to that people. Paul laid us a foundation, yes. But Hebrews is not laying a foundation. It's reaffirming to them the things that God has already spoken. It's a reaffirming. You know how long that covenant has been in writing? When did Jeremiah write about the new covenant? 600 B.C.? What is that, Russell? 2,600 years the new covenant's been in, in writing? Promised? And then Christ came and shed his blood to make the provision of allowing God to make that new covenant. God couldn't make that new covenant with Israel until the blood of the New Testament had been shed. And now here's the mediator of that new covenant speaking to Israel. Not like Moses did. Not like Moses who said, if you do this and do that, and if you don't, it is, it is him saying, I will. And here they are. Where are they at? Where's Israel at? I'll tell you where they're at. They're getting ready to build God a, a, another temple over there. And start, and start shedding the same sacrifices which were never able to take away sins. All in rejection of all this. And so the writer of Hebrews is reaffirming these things. And he's telling the nation of Israel, you better give a more earnest heed to the things which you have heard. You better not harden your hearts against the mediator of this new covenant like your fathers did to Moses. And he's saying, he's saying you better not harden your hearts. And he says, he said, let all of you take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Because how's Israel going to go into this thing? Faith. Right? When he writes Hebrews chapter 12 and he says laying he says, let, let, let us lay aside every weight and that sin that so easily besets us. How many times you heard preachers get up behind that pulpit and say, oh, that sin's different for every one of us. The sin that so easily besets is unbelief. That's what the book is about. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Right? Now, he wants them to, to give the earnest heed to what they have heard, harden not their hearts, but he also wants them to go on to perfection. Look there in Hebrews 6 1. Israel's at the crossroads of their covenant. They're either going to enter into this covenant or they're going to be cursed and destroyed. And so, and so. You can't read the book of Hebrews as a book written to saved people. It's a book written to a nation who has promises. Some of them are going to inherit those promises and some of them are not. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling the nation of Israel here, look in chapter 6, therefore leaving the principles. This is where he's going to take them in chapter 7 onward now is leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation. Now look back in, look in verse 3. And this 
We will we do if God permit. You know, this is all the way back. Let me, let me read. Y'all, yeah, we still got time. Look, look back in Hosea real quick. I love this stuff, man. Hosea 5, verse 15. This, this, this ties in right here with Hebrews 6. In fact, it's amazing that Hebrews 6, 3 actually references back to Hosea 6, 3. But uh, there's nothing to the verses and chapters in, in the King James Bible, you know. But look, look at Hosea 5, 15. This is how God, cl God closes chapter 5. I will go and return to my place. Until what? Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. You see that? Now look in chapter 6. Come, let us return unto who? The Lord. For he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. And in the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now watch this. Then shall we know if what? If we follow on to know who? The Lord. That's where Israel's at in the book of Hebrews. They're at that crossroads. They're either going to follow on to know him or they're going to fall away. And that's what Hebrews 6 is laying out for them. They're either going to fall away from all this stuff right here or they're going to follow on to know the Lord through this new program, through that new covenant. Because that's the promises of that new covenant. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. I'm going to put my laws in their hearts. Israel's going to become that nation that is going to be able to teach other nations the ways of God. But they have to they have to come to terms with this new covenant, the, the mediator and the high priest of it, and they have to continue on by faith, and they have to go on to perfection because if they fall away, it's over. There is no more sacrifice. There is, there is none of that stuff. Look, look, look at what he says there. He says in Hebrews 6, come back to Hebrews 6 real quick. I promise, guys, next week I wanted to spend a little bit of time, a little bit more time on preparing us for this book. Next week we're, we're going to start getting into the verses here, I, I promise you. But, but look at Hebrews 6, 7. I wanted you to understand the covenantal part of the New Testament and what the book of Hebrews is laying out, what the purpose of the book is, its outline and its purpose. Look at Hebrews 6, 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. That's two Israels there. Right? That is two Israels there. One that's going to be blessed one that's going to be cursed. And what determines, what determines this, this blessing and cursing upon the nation? Well, if they bring forth the herbs by which the rain that came upon it was designed to bring forth, they're going to be blessed. But if they continue to bear thorns and briars, they're rejected. Now, guys, this goes back to Isaiah 55. For as the rain cometh upon the earth, so is my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that for which I sent it forth. Israel has been, has been receiving that rain of the word of God now since Moses' day. God has at different times and in sundry, sundry times and in different manners, he's been, he's been raining his word upon that nation of people. And now as we approach the 70th week of Daniel, God has spoken everything he's going to speak to that people. 
And the, the ones who bring forth the fruit that God's word was designed to bring forth, repentance, faith, all that stuff, the ones who bring forth those fruits are going to receive the blessing, but those who continue to bear thorns and briars are going to be rejected and nigh to cursing whose end is to be burned. That's what's going to happen. Two nations of people there. One who go into the new covenant, the promises, and those who are rejected. Right? Just like Esau was. And he's going to talk about this in Hebrews chapter 12. And so, in closing, Hebrews chapter 1, set up, set up for next week. Hebrews chapter 1. <coughs> Get this and understand this. That verses 1 and 2, and then not only that, but there's seven things there about Jesus Christ that we're going to look at. Down to the end of the sentence in verse 4. But there, there's, there's two things here that I, that, that, well, there's one thing here that we're going to prepare for for next week. And that is the subject of Hebrews is God's word to Israel throughout their history. That's what the book's about. God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds and he's going to talk about seven things about Jesus Christ. But the subject of this book is dealing with what God has spoken to Israel throughout their history. Not just in time past but also what he and so basically you're dealing with everything from the book of Genesis clear up through to the book of John. Right? And this is what God has spoken to Israel in their, in their when, when we talk about what God spake unto the fathers, look in Acts 3, and I'm closing. Look in Acts 3. Let's look at this real quick. Acts chapter 3. Verse 17, Peter says, And now, brethren, I wot that through your ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's a promise. That their sins will be blotted out when Christ returns. That's, that's going to be preached in Hebrews 9, 28. Unto them that look for him shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. But look at what he says in verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. Meaning national repentance was going to bring national deliverance for the nation of Israel. That's what Acts 3, listen, any man today who thinks that the early part of the book of Acts is doctrine for today, there ain't a one of them that's got the guts to get up and preach Acts 3 to anybody today. You realize how big of a liar I'd be to stand up in that pulpit and tell you all if you'd repent God would send Jesus Christ here? That's not a message we could preach today. Now look at what he says in verse 21. Whom, talking about Christ, whom the heaven must receive until. Meaning Christ in heaven has an expiration date. That's what that word, we say that all the time. or Some of us do. When you read the word until, it means it has an expiration date. Christ being in heaven right now has an expiration date. What is it? The times of restitution of all things. Now let me ask you something. Is he there? Is he in heaven? Then guess what hasn't started? The times of restitution. The times of restitution begin with the second coming of Christ. What are these times of restitution? Well, they're the, they're, they're, they're the times which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Remember when Christ when, when, when Christ, uh, before he ascended back to heaven, his disciples said, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's the times of restitution. It involves Israel's restoration to the land, 
the restitution of the Davidic covenant, the Davidic kingdom, the Davidic throne, Israel in their land under the new covenant, right? This is what's being offered here in Acts 3. If you'll repent, God will send Christ and the times of restitution spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began will begin. Look at what he says. Verse 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Right there it is. Moses and Christ. The two mediators to Israel. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after. That's Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. As many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the what? Covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the what? Kindreds of the earth be blessed. When? Israel's covenant. Right? Now God is blessing the Gentiles today through the dispensation of the ministry of, of the New Testament, the dispensational ministry of the New Testament. Peter's talking about all the families of the earth. All the families of the earth. All. Not part of them like we are. Right? If they're diminishing be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more they're what? Fullness. And so we're talking about a time in which all nations and all families are going to be blessed when? In the times of restitution. Through Israel's covenant program and their kingdom and when they enter into their fullness of their program, then all the earth is going to be blessed to the nation of Israel. Right? That's what Peter's preaching in Acts 3. That was what the message of the prophets was to the nation of Israel. And so when you're dealing there in Hebrews 1.1 with what God had spoken in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, that's what you're dealing with. Those times of restitution. Of Israel entering into their covenant promises under the new covenant made possible through the blood of the New Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so any questions on any of this? So y'all understand every bit of that perfectly. <laughs> y'all smarter than I am. It's taken me years and years and years to understand this stuff. <clears throat> but understand that as we study through the book of Hebrews, we're dealing with the covenant promises made to the nation of Israel in their prophetic scriptures, and then Christ came as the mediator of that, of that covenant and of that New Testament to them, and Israel has yet, and in fact, and in fact, you don't have the right today. None of us have the right today to preach that covenant program. That means every covenant theologian out there today who's preaching the covenant promises of Israel to us is, is a liar, right? We have a dispensation of the New Testament. And, and, and though that's where we get our riches, our benefits, and our calling and our vocations and all that stuff is in Paul's epistles. And so I'm, I'm a covenant theologian and a dispensational theologian. I believe you've got to rightly divide them. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of life, God. I thank you for the precious blood of our Savior uh, that was shed, Lord, to, to redeem us back to you, to redeem us from Adam and the condemnation of sin and death in him and how your, your, your son shed his blood to, to establish a new testament uh, for heaven and earth in his precious blood and to, and to bring us in, in reconciliation unto you and to make us the beneficiaries of, of the New Testament, Lord, as your sons and as your, your heirs, heirs of God, as Paul said. I thank you for that, Father. And I, I just thank you, God, for, for making known unto us the mystery of your will, Father, and, and, and uh, through, through the dispensation of the mystery to Paul, but also in the, 
in the, in the prophecies and in the covenants of promise that you've made with the nation of Israel, Lord, we see the fullness of your plan and purpose for heaven and earth. God, help us to understand the distinctions, but also help us to understand the fellowship and the relationship uh, that heaven and earth plays, Lord, and, and how Paul said in Romans chapter 8 that the whole creation, uh, the earnest expectation of the creature today is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That, that is, that, is that, new, that new man that you're creating today, Lord, through Jew and Gentile, believing and, and being recipients of the riches of the glory of your son, Lord, the whole hope that you've given the creation in that Old Testament and in those scriptures, Lord, is now waiting for what you're doing today. And God, I, I just thank you for all that, Lord. I ask that you keep us safe. Be with those that couldn't be here tonight, Lord. Uh, we pray for Brother Bill that he would he would he would that you would help him with his vertigo and that he would start feeling better. And we just ask it all in the lovely and precious name of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. Amen.